Welcome back to Mysterious Goings On. Hey, it's me, Alex. Thought I'd update you a little bit as we get to uh, the very end of November at this recording on what's been going on a little bit with me and uh, sharing some information uh, about uh, recent publications, etc. on this one. I wanted to start off with something that is kind of the elephant in the room for me right now. You're no stranger, if you're a listener to this podcast, to my occasional riffs about my health or strange things that happen to me in my daily life. And this one kind of qualifies on all fronts. So let me just get right to it. Since as a young man was told that nothing good happens after midnight, or I've been told a variation of that, maybe nothing good happens after 2 a.m. Depends on who's doing the telling. You know, my parents would say uh, midnight. I had a grandparent who would say, ah, 2 a.m., you know. But basically... A lot of the bad stuff that happens in our society seems to happen when uh, it's very dark outside and the moon is full, or not full, but it's the thing of bad stuff seems to happen when people have time on their hands and there's darkness and probably substances and all sorts of things, right? But, you know, there are bad things that happen after midnight that can happen in your own home. And that, my friends, is where I was when I felt the knife go into my back. I was not well for a few days prior. I had been working very hard for a new presentation, a new class, a seminar I teach on crisis communications, and um, I was really not sweating it, but working hard on it and making sure that all my materials were together and I'd rehearsed it properly. It was a two-hour seminar that I've done uh, lots of classes for for a local institution, and I wanted to make sure that I made a good impression with this new curriculum. So that all got handled by Thursday of the week. Uh, I even had a, a friend unexpectedly show up and take the course or the seminar, and uh, we decided to get a quick bite of lunch afterward. Now, sometimes after giving a, a talk, even for two hours on my feed, where you having to be quick and think and answer questions and keep things moving, it can be a bit draining. You know, I'm loath to admit that um, these things kind of wipe me out. I don't know how teachers and lecturers who do it every day do it, other than, I guess, repetition and they learn to pace themselves better. But... Uh, Anyway, we're sitting over some bowls of soup at a deli not far from uh, the uh, curriculum training site and uh, just catching up, and, and I started feeling bad. Like, you know that feeling when you get the flu and, you, and they say it's like you, you got hit by a truck, that, that kind of feeling, and that's exactly what it was. And I thought, oh, God, well, I had my flu shot. This sucks, but I feel like I've got the flu coming on. Okay, all right. Well, I didn't say anything to him. He had to go soon, and I enjoyed his company, and I wanted to talk to him and just see how things were, and uh, I just kind of sweated it out, but I couldn't finish my food. I probably ate, I would say, a tenth of the bowl of soup. It was chicken noodle. It was really nice, but I, I just couldn't finish it. I felt poorly. Um, he, he went off, and I said, I'm just going to hang back here, and I drank some water and just tried to regroup and say to myself, you know, what's going on? I couldn't go home. I had a... Uh, couple of engagements at two o'clock uh, my wife and I had refinanced the house so I had to go sign a bunch of papers and here we are it's like 11 50 and I've got to kill time between um, 11 50 and two o'clock in that area of town because I had to show up and sign those papers you can't on a mortgage you don't get to say I'm sick you got to go sign those papers uh, or it could ruin the whole process and it's going to save us some money to refinance the house so I knew I had to deal with that and then after that, at 5 o'clock, um, I was supposed to go do a volunteer thing for some uh, local nonprofits with three nonprofits and the communication specialists and professionals like myself show up and hear their marketing and PR issues and we offer free advice. Well, I was looking forward to doing that too. It was at a local college campus and I was going to be there around 5-ish, 5.30. Well, I'd already eaten technically and I wasn't hungry, but I had to light somewhere until two o'clock. So I thought, oh, okay. And I went to, there's a hotel that has a Starbucks in the lobby. So I went there and just got a cup of coffee that I didn't want and sat there with my laptop and uh, tried my best to focus on work and, and getting through some things, just kind of killing time. Um, but by the time I, uh, two o'clock came around, picked up my wife at her uh, office and we then drove her to the mortgage banker and we signed the papers. That takes about half an hour. It's not stressful or taxing. It's just, you know, I got through that and I felt a little better. I felt myself rally. I told my wife, I said, you know, I don't feel well. And I told her what was going on. She said, do you have to go to this thing tonight? And I said, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to go because I felt feverish. I just felt tired. I thought, okay, I'm probably got the flu or a low grade form of the flu. Went home and did not feel good for the next couple of days, Friday and Saturday. 
but just chalked it up to, yeah, maybe a you know, mild flu kind of slipped through the cracks of the inoculation. It happens, you know. The flu vaccine is by no means 100% guaranteed to solve all your problems. But I have read that if you get the vaccine and you still get a flu, it's usually not as hard hitting because your body's attenuated somewhat to expect a virus to come knocking or whatever it was. So, so I'm just like, okay, I'll take it easy. Didn't go to the gym, just kind of chilled. So it was Saturday night going into Sunday morning, uh, about three o'clock, as I say, this was after midnight, this was after two, and I awoke to what I can only describe sincerely as I felt like someone had taken a knife and shoved it below my two lowest ribs on the left side of my back and was slowly turning the knife back and forth, back and forth between my ribs. Now, you're listening and saying, oh my goodness, how dramatic. Well, mere words cannot express just how painful this was. And I thought, wow, okay, hmm, must have pulled a muscle, don't know how. Maybe I did it in my sleep. You know, things happen. I'm an old guy. I thought, well, and and I, I had the urge to go to the bathroom, which I normally don't in the middle of the night. I'm an old guy, but I'm blessed that I don't have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night most of the time. I really don't. But I thought, well, I'll go. So I get up to go to the bathroom, and it does virtually nothing to alleviate the pain. And I am just go back and lay down for about 20 more minutes, and the pain intensifies to my left side. It's really hurting. And I thought, well, I'll go downstairs and, and just, uh, you know, I don't want to wake up my wife. It's, it's like 3-something, 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't want to cause any problems. So I go downstairs, put on something on TV, and try to get comfortable on the couch. Can't. I mean, I'm moving every 3 or 4 minutes, just trying to find a comfortable position, and the pain's getting worse, and I'm just thinking, God, what is going on here? And then I realized, of course, that I have been on tour with the Stones for years. To backtrack, I've got a urologist who I go to once a year who x-rays my kidneys because I have a couple of stones, good-sized stones, anywhere from one millimeter on up in each kidney. Well, it was pretty clear that it was either Mick or Keith was coming out or, or, or getting rowdy or partying on the tour bus that... Uh, <laughs> was my kidney. So I was like, oh, geez. So I, I thought, no, let's just see how I do. So I waited another 20 minutes after I made that thought, and, and, I, and I couldn't even sit down. So I was pacing downstairs, pacing in my, my family room, just pacing around, in the not in the dark, but the light of the television, just trying to alleviate this pain. Just I, I couldn't sit down. There was no way. Just so I was pacing and pacing, and then, I was, and then the pain got so bad. A couple of times I had to catch my breath. And I staggered while walking. Friends, I know some of you, well, all of you who have not lived through this, been through this, are probably laughing and saying, oh, come on. Trust me. It is the most exquisitely malignant pain you will ever feel in your entire life, if you're a man in particular. I've had a lot of women who've had them compare it to the pain of childbirth. And they're like, at least with childbirth, you can get a... You can get a block, you know, you can get a spinal block. And uh, I have to take them at their word. Um, so that's it. I, 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 I quit staggering around. And I go up to my uh, wife. I wake her up and, and say, I, I, I'm i sorry, I've got to go to the ER. And she's like, "What? what's going on? I said, I think I got a stone coming out. And it's it's brutal. And she doesn't think, she doesn't th- say a word. She gets up, she gets uh, up, she goes and wakes up my 11 year old daughter. Um, I collapse back on the bed trying to just, you know, get some semblance of relief, not getting it. So I start getting dressed. She's dressed, my daughter's dressed. We go downstairs, and I swear to God, as soon as I get downstairs dressed and ready to go to the ER, the pain, it, it subsides. It's gone. It's not gone completely, but like gone in a big way. And I said, you know, this uh, this is crazy. I I don't have, I don't have it. This I'm false alarm. I'm embarrassed. I'm sorry, girls. Let, let's just don't even worry about it. And then, how about this? We'll just sit here for a little while. So we all kind of sat there, watched a little TV. I felt like, you know, the pain had gone from a knife in my back to like kind of a dull toothache pain in my back. If that makes sense too. You know, when you know you've got a toothache and you take enough medication where it dulls down. That's kind of where it was. And I thought, well, okay. And I'd taken some ibuprofen and some Tylenol. I forgot to mention that. So I think that was um, interacting a little bit with the pain. 
But then it started roaring back. And that's how I said, oh, that's it. So we got in the car, piled in the car, went to the emergency room. Luckily, very it was Sunday morning, very light, nobody in the waiting room. They got me in very quickly. Um, as soon as I got in there, incredibly good nurse, Charlie, starts talking to me. He's like, I'm hooking you up to an IV here. And I told him what, he, what I had. Uh, he's like, yeah, it sounds like a stone. Have you got him before? I said, yeah, but I said, I've never had this kind of pain before. I'd passed one previously in Vegas, believe it or not, but I didn't even know I was passing one. I had a bad fever and I was sick for a couple of days in Vegas. And um, we just kind of reconstructed that. My urologist and I were thinking that probably a small stone had passed, but this was different. This was a bigger stone and it was coming out angry. So uh, they put me on, uh, I forget, it's a Toradol or something. They put me on something in the IV besides uh, something to hydrate me. They also, because I was a little dehydrated, they also put me on some pain medication, but it's not a narcotic. It was something else. I think it was like a high intensity ibuprofen or some sort to help with inflammation. That started to dull things down, but I was still in a lot of pain. My wife and daughter are sitting there next to me. I'm on a gurney. My little girl's being real brave. The doctor comes in and says, so you're pacing around all that. So he said, yeah. I said, yeah, I was pacing. I don't know what the deal is. He goes, well, that's how I know it's a kidney stone and not your, uh, not your appendix. I said, appendix people want to sit still so the pain doesn't, doesn't grow. Uh, a kidney stone people can't sit still. And I'm like, oh, well, there you go. And it's on the left side too. So I knew it wasn't my appendix. And he said, yeah. And so he says, we need to do a CT. And I'm like, oh, those are expensive, but fine. So they wheeled me in the gurney out of the out of the ER area where I was, I waved to my daughter and my wife, who were just great, and, and holding it together just fine. Was, nobody thought my life was in danger, but they were worried because I was in a lot of pain. And it was the weirdest thing to be wheeled on a gurney. It's like out of a movie. I was like, God, I wish I had my phone. I would love to video this going down the hallway. Not that they let me, you know, of the ER with kind of people kind of walking past or, you know, EMT types falling away as I pass them and things like that. And, um, put me in the big donut there. They got me down there, and of course I had, did the dignified thing, which is drop my pants, so that they and then they put me in there, and they they do the uh, whole uh, CT scan and bring me back, uh, get me back up, put my pants back up, and, uh, and they wheel me back into my room, and uh, more interactions with the nurses who were great and the other staff, and then the doctor. Long story short, they're like, yeah, this is. This is not good. This is going to pass. So we're going to give you some hydrocodone, and we're going to give you some uh, Flomax. This is Flomax helps you, helps you, helps you pee. Basically, it helps widen things out. So, you know, I guess the idea is that if it widens out your ureter with, where the stones are hung up. So anyway, I, they put me on that and said, okay. And I said, well, what do I do? They said, well, if you don't pass it in the next couple of days or you're getting close on your medication, you should probably call your your urologist. And I'm like, well, I'm calling him tomorrow or today. So I get home, the hydrocodone really was effective in knocking down a lot of the uh, pain. So you're only supposed to take a certain amount every four hours. And that dose, the first dose was incredible. It knocked it down for four hours, but then it's like my body got used to it fast. The knife returned, the pen knife would be there for a little while. And then the, the, the big serrated bread knife kind of got in there after about 45 minutes to an hour. So, uh, I tough it out through through Sunday and Monday. Call the urologist, explain. He says, "Okay, uh, well, let's do some watch and waiting, and uh, uh, do you want? And, and maybe we'll get you to come in." And we get an appointment, like an emergency appointment, on I think Tuesday or Wednesday. But it doesn't sound like an emergency, does it? But it got me in there. He looked at the CT. He says, "Yeah, it's right on the edge. It's a, it's this close to going out of your." your ureter, which is the tube from your kidney to your bladder, it's right on the edge of falling into your bladder. And if it'll do that, you're fine. And he says, it's, it's, a, it's a nice size one. It's over two millimeters, close to three millimeter. And I'm like, Ugh. I said, well, I just don't know. And he said, well, look, we can, let's get you in surgery. We can get rid of it today. And I'm like, oh, can we try? And, I said, let's try and pass it. If you'll just give me some more medication to get me by. And he says, okay. So this was like Tuesday or Wednesday. And he says, how about Friday for surgery? And if something told me, no, and I'm cheap, first of all. And even though I'm suffering like crazy, um, I decided, no, I'm going to uh, I'm going to try and push to Monday. So we schedule surgery for Monday. If it doesn't come out by then, we go get it. And I'll spare you the details of that. It's it's not fun, but it, it beats having a kidney stone. So he gives me oxycodone, which is a little bit higher uh, value or higher uh, punch for the pain. And uh, I start taking that. 
But one of the side effects of oxycodone, like with most scheduled narcotics, is you take enough of it and uh, it freezes up your bowels for various reasons because of the effects it has on the nerves and stuff like that. So over the next three days, I came past water. I know everybody's going, gosh, this is exciting and, and fun. I'm glad I'm eating while I'm listening to this. But anyway, I could do that, but I couldn't do anything else. And I was re retaining a lot of fluid. So three days into the, you know, three days into the medication. So I'm looking, it's like Friday. And on Friday, I'm miserable. It's like the worst day. I'm hating life. And I, I, I get out of the, I, showers kind of help, made me feel a little better. I could stand under a hot shower. Your heating pads help. So I, I took a shower, got out of the shower, and I thought, well, and I'm looking at my very, very distended, bloated belly. And I look at it. So I get on the scale, which I hadn't done. I had gained over 10 pounds. Now, 10 pounds of that, some of it's come from not being able to fully uh, go to the bathroom. But a lot of it was just that fluid retention. All this fluid retention because my kidney was swollen. Um, all the effects of the kidney stone on my body. The trauma that it's inflicting. The pain. All this stuff. So I would gained 10 pounds. I, I look like... A Macy's Day Parade balloon of me. It was awful. I was wearing an extra large. I have an extra large shirt that I sometimes wear to the gym, you know, on a fat day, you know, and I just don't want anything too tight. I just want to loose to move around in. And it was snug on me. I couldn't believe it. So here I am. I'm bloated. I uh, can't go to the bathroom. Everything hurts. Can't get comfortable. I start to despair that I'll ever feel good again. On Friday and Saturday, I'm hating life because it's like, you idiot, you could have had this out by now if you had just not been such a skin flint and just said, fine, let's go do the surgery. You know, I could have done that. So I'm kicking myself. And uh, my wife and my daughter are incredible, doing wonderful things, taking such good care of me. And I'm still, you know, I'm just still miserable, the pain and the discomfort. And I start getting snappish with people and short-tempered and nobody, nobody got upset with me. They totally got it. And I apologized immediately. But... Sometimes even the most simple question would kind of um, elicit a, not these exact words, but this attitude. What are you, an idiot? Can you not understand this, you know, kind of response from me that I instantly regretted? But that, that just shows you how when you are pushed so far for so long with chronic pain and discomfort, so much of your personality starts to fall away um, or the things that, you know, you do as a decent decent a civil adult falls away because you're just suffering. Um, <laughs> so I, it, it fascinated me, and I've got to tell you, there were moments there where I would be in the throes of the pain. Like, I, I always hated it when it was like the, like the oxycodone seemed to knock it down for two or three hours, sometimes four, depending on the day, depending on the level of the pain. It was always on a one to ten, like the day I got the stones, it was a ten. Um, then I had some days that were, they're blissful, like Monday night football. I, I forgot to mention that uh, Monday night, the, the the Monday night after the Sunday, the pain level went down to like a three or a four, and I was like, well, maybe I passed it and didn't know it, but apparently not. Most of the time, the pain was between a seven and a ten. And I remember I was last, like the last hour when the pain medication was wearing off, and you know you're not supposed to stack up pain meds; you're supposed to try to wait it out. And I would kind of do a cocktail of. Uh, uh, ibuprofen and Tylenol and, and then of course the oxycodone when I could and um, but I remember a few times just crawling out of bed and getting on the floor and writhing on the floor in pain literally on the carpet writhing I mean again if you've not been through this you might be thinking oh my god what a drama king right no and in fact I told the, the doctor this at the urology clinic and they said, oh no, no, one of my staff had one here at the office and all she could do was writhe on the floor in pain until we could get her fixed up. And I'm just like, wow, incredible. But so so as the writer and you know just somebody who's exploring being alive, I, I just really asked myself a few times, okay, this is pain, this is excruciating pain, this is what this is. And I found myself saying to myself a lot, um, I get, and I told my wife this, I said, I get why people who have chronic pain and can't cure it, first they'll turn to substances to try to fix it, and the substances stop working or don't work, and the medications, same thing. Um, and I see why a lot of people who are just in agony with chronic pain often will end their lives. And I'm, gosh, please understand, I understand I had a kidney stone, but you know, not cancer or not some chronic pain syndrome. 
but I get it now more than I ever got it before. I used to always think, oh, come on, you know, there's got to be something. But there are, there are pains. There are physical pains that people have that cannot really be effectively treated. And I see why people lose their minds. Just lose their minds. Back to that in a minute. So here we are. I know I've jumped around a little bit, but uh, we're on the weekend. It's Saturday, Friday and Saturday. I'm bloated. I'm the I'm the parade float. I'm or the balloon or whatever. I'm miserable, and I'm thinking this is never going to end. Well, one thing I had to do, by the way, and I didn't mention this, is since hey, we know each other pretty well, don't we? So there, here we go. One thing you have you get used to if you have stones is you got the basket or the the, the filter or the or the sieve or whatever. It's a little. Uh, gadget your your urologist or the ER will give you that uh, you, you pee through it's it's basically like if you were panning for gold you know you would you would pan like in the river you know the pan has a the this um, like screen screen door screen kind of sized or smaller actually uh, uh, surface so that you can pan for gold the water can go through but the uh, the gold can can show up right so I'm panning for gold. <laughs> <laughs> if only this damn stone was made of gold. I am panning for gold. Every time I urinate, I have to urinate through this, I'll call it a basket. Let's just say it's a basket. It's it's like a it's like a funnel, and at the bottom of the funnel is a kind of a filtery thing. Like a, Think of a very fine mesh, like a screen door, but way, 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 way more fine than that. Designed to catch things smaller than a millimeter or, or you know, way smaller, okay? So I'd been using that all week and just despairing things you would see in there i would get excited occasionally and think oh look i found something and it's like no that's not what that was it, it, things come out um, besides urine especially when you're dealing with this tissue comes out mucosa all sorts of stuff but not the stone i was looking for that's what i wanted well so i got back so let's get back to saturday and friday and when i'm my worst and i'm at i'm at my lowest and i'm just thinking you know, I'm never going to get better again. And in fact, I had a client, I resigned the client. Basically, I said, I can't help you even on when I, because I was in this constant state for almost two weeks of either being, um, uh, this constant state of either being in such excruciating pain, I couldn't focus or being so doped up on, on narcotics, I couldn't focus. There, there really wasn't much in between. And I just didn't feel good, didn't want to work. I mean, so I ended up basically you know, it wasn't all me. They they kind of had some communications issues, but basically, I resigned the work because um, I just couldn't. It wasn't fair to them, and it wasn't fair to me. Too much pressure on me when I'm trying to deal with my health, and, and not fair to them when they have deadlines and deliverables they needed. So, so I, those things were going on, and I I was just despairing. I was like, I lost work over this. Am I ever going to get well? And then I thought, well, the light at the end of the tunnel is Monday because that's your surgeries at 6 a.m. Um, get there at 6 a.m. You, you know, you uh, by seven, whatever, they go in. I won't describe the whole procedure, but basically they would they would go in. It's not terrible. It's invasive, but not invasive in a way like it's going to leave scars. Let's leave it at that. But they work their way up and they have this little basket that can go up there and grab a stone. Or if they can't grab the stone, they have a laser on the end where they can blast the stone, blast that little fricker. And uh, then its pieces kind of will, will pass on their own. Um, so they have that, and they also put in a stent. They'll put a stent, which is all a stent is, is like you have a heart stents. You know, the, the, it widens an, a, a vein or, or, or a vessel, a blood vessel, so that, or a tube, so that it's like a putting a straw in that kind of blows up a little bit, so they can blow up the ureter where it's big enough for pieces can easily pass through to the bladder and then pass on out. So that's what I was looking forward to on, on Monday. The, so that would have been a week and a day after the diagnosis and the, the ER visit and about five days after the visit to the urologist at his office. And by then I was just looking for, I was counting the minutes until I could just get in the car and and go up there. And I hadn't even mentioned that first trip to, I had to drive 30 minutes. My wife drove me 30 minutes to see the urologist a few days before that, right? And didn't have, an, the pain medication did not handle the drive and the drive was so awful. I was cussing and cursing at other drivers. Now they couldn't hear me and all that, but drivers that were slow or cut us off or whatever, I was in such agony and so frustrated. And I was snapping at my wife about, why did you take this straight? Like, can't you tell? Like, this is killing me. You know, get get us there. Why are you driving so slowly? Anyway, and I was just like, I just remember thinking, 
Okay, I gotta make this other 35 minute drive to the surgery center on Monday, but I'm gonna dope up as much as I can, because I told them ahead of time, I, they said, don't take any medications for after midnight. I said, well, I'll be taking one medication, that's pain medication, or I'm not coming. And they said, oh, you can't, just tell us how much you took. And I'm like, I'm gonna take the heaviest dose I can possibly take, you know, just to get through the car ride and get there and get put under and get that stone out. So, I talked to the surgery people, I talked to my doctor, he's ready to do it, it's all on a Monday. Um, and uh, Sunday morning I get up and I I noticed a peculiar thing before I got up out of bed, it was about, hmm, hmm, about 9 a.m. Had a rough night, like a really, about night before I had about three hours that were horrible, horrible, horrible. Um, so I, but, but then I got some peace out of that. It's like that three hours was, was nastier than you know what, but then, um, I got to rest. I got to actually get through a night of sleep. And there's one thing I haven't mentioned much, by the way, too. Another thing that was adding to the misery level through this whole process, I never got a good night's sleep. So you, you add in sleep deprivation to pain and discomfort and worry and suffering and all that. And you, you get just this wonderful human being you want to spend all your time with. <laughs> anyway, so, but this was, in, I, I woke up thinking, wow, I think I got eight hours after the misery ended the, the evening before. And I thought, wow. So... I go downstairs, have a cup of coffee, talk to my wife, and I'm not even taking any, I said, I'm not taking any Oxy right now. She says, how are you doing? You know, I said, I took a couple of uh, Tylenol, and I thought, I'm okay, I'm see how I can go without taking any Oxy, because also remember, I very much would like to go to the bathroom again, you know, all the way. Okay, well, yeah, in for a penny, in for a pound, right, folks? All right, so I go to the restroom, though, and lo and behold, I'm like a 49er. I just do my business, look down, and there in the basket, panning for gold, was this tiny, jagged, black, nasty looking little knife that was in my back. It was Mick, by the way. It was Mick on a bad day. It was Mick Jagger. Mick Jagged, the kidney stone. That's what I've named him. Mick Jagged. I looked at it, I couldn't believe it. I said, what the? I didn't feel it come out. It was just magically there. It was like panning for gold. And there's Mick Jagged, the stone. I look at it closely. I I, I can't believe it. I, I touch it <laughs> and it's it's jagged, it's hard, and it's it's this awful, nasty thing. And if you don't know what a what a kidney stone's made of, it's it's not like I swallowed a rock or anything. It's um, it's it's usually uh, when a small speck of calcium from the urine forms in the kidney, and or and then it gets into the, the ureter, as I mentioned, which is the passage from your kidney to your bladder, and then more minerals stick to it, and it forms a tiny stone, and and, and it gets hung up a lot of the time. It gets hung up in your kidney. This one had been hanging up in my kidney for a long time, but then when it, the worst part is when it leaves your kidney, it gets in the ureter, the tube between the kidney and the bladder, right? Well, this jaggedy thing had been what it had done. It got hung up in my ureter and was poking it with these it's had these jagged edges i don't know how to explain it. i wish i'd taken a really good photo of it to, to show you and you're like wow we've heard more than we want to know about this and now you want to show us a picture but it was awful but i looked at it and i was so excited i kind of rinsed it off and dried it off the basket and i came out of the restroom i went to my wife and i said look oh my god and it was like christmas morning and i just hugged her and held her and i said thank you for getting me through this i'm, I'm done and I felt great. I had almost zero pain. In fact, I had some pain. I was sore, but the very absence of that excruciating pain, the absence of that, and the fact that within within an hour or two, uh, since I'd been off the uh, the other medications, I started to, everything else started to free up, and within a day, I had lost almost 10 pounds of of, of retained material. It was the absence of pain and just the normalcy again. And it was incredible. And still had to use the basket for a couple more days and other things came out, smaller stones actually, little tiny little little, little bits and pieces. But the big guy was out, Mick was out, and a couple of his roadies came along with him, little tiny roadies as I call them, but uh, that was it. But uh, called the uh, surgery center, called the doctors on call. They're like, oh no, you're, you're, we're canceling. Congrats, you're good. Just save the stone, send, give it to us, and we'll analyze it and see what it is, and maybe we can figure out a way to prevent another one. So, nothing good happens after midnight, and uh, passing the stone didn't happen after midnight. It happened after around, what, 10 a.m. or something like that? Uh, 
but uh, it was an experience. And it's an experience that could happen again because I still have stones in both kidneys that could descend at any time. But I, at least I fully understand now how it works. I fully understand what to do. Um, I'll be armed with knowledge of kind of the best practices to mitigate pain and to also do myself some favors by not waiting around and suffering, go to the, the emergency room and uh, do those things that need to be done. But uh, it's just, uh, <laughs> I don't know even why I tell you these things. I, it's my little confessional, but it's, I guess the main thing besides the kind of the lightheartedness of calling it, you know, Mick Jagged and um, some of the silliness. It's just human suffering, you know, um, pain, physical pain. Um, it's so real. And it, it was a lesson for me. And I choose to view this as a lesson. And it's a reminder to me that uh, any day, any day of your life that you don't have any kind of pain, you know, don't even have so much as a headache. Don't have a pulled muscle. Nothing. No matter how old you are, particularly if you're older than me or my age. You know, if you're middle aged and up and you don't, you go a day without pain. My gosh, that's fantastic. But I guess what I'm saying is, um, you know, that kind of cliche. Everybody's got some kind of pain they're feeling. You know, um, everybody's got something in their life. It's so true. But um, what's really in stark relief for me is I find a lot of the physical pains that I really that really bothered me prior to this to be very trivial. And uh, I feel honestly blessed that I had this experience. I don't want to have it again. And I'm telling you this, particularly men, I think it's like 70% of kidney stone sufferers are men, maybe more. So women don't get it as much. But if you, if you know of somebody who has a stone, please be sympathetic and empathetic and uh, an understanding. If you're the boss and one of your staff has one, please know they're not loafing, they're not faking, they're indeed in trouble and they're doing their best. And, and I hope you have a, a partner in your life who's as wonderful as mine is and uh, help you get through it because she never complained and she's always wonderful and checked in on me and it was really great. And here I am, uh, uh, it's been uh, uh, about a week removed, almost a week removed, and uh, feeling better. Had a couple of gym visits since, which was great because I missed the gym for two weeks. And uh, um, still tired a little bit, still a little sore, but I'm good. I hope this was of some interest to you. If not, uh, not your cup of tea, I understand. But uh, here on Mysterious Goings On, the, the, some of the most mysterious things that go on are in our own bodies. And it's just interesting to me that uh, sometimes the very thing that you think you can count on, something simple like your own kidney, can turn on you. A couple of quick announcements here before I let you go. First things first, uh, speaking of uh, ailments, uh, you may recall uh, my episode, which is one of my most downloaded, also featuring kind of a health-related deal, was on losing it. And it was the episode where they had diagnosed me with glaucoma more or less incorrectly. Well, I had a follow-up visit uh, a couple of weeks ago, just to let you know. And I'm fine. Actually, they're like, you know what? We think you're fine. You're borderline. But uh, they wouldn't admit that they were wrong before. They just said, well, we got ahead of ourselves, but you're fine. So wanted you to know that I continue to do well on that front. Thank goodness. Also wanted to let you know, due to my being ill for a few weeks, a lot of my fall guests have fallen off the uh, schedule. Um, I have three guests set up to go, uh, or at least tentatively agreeing to come on. And this happened and it just lost it. And so with the holiday season upon us, I'm recording this the day after Thanksgiving. No idea, no idea um, who will be back and, and available. Uh, but I will come back and update you and let you know if nobody else can be on the rest of the year, you'll at least get me. So uh, I hope you're enjoying the new book, Pilot's Shadow, which is uh, in the print version is in Pilot's Rose, the new edition, the 10th anniversary edition. But if you just want the uh, Pilot's Shadow, it's available as an ebook on Amazon.com. In fact, there's all kinds of specials. You really need to be watching Amazon.com between now and the end of the year. There'll be all kinds of giveaways of uh, free ebooks on Amazon. Um, 
you know, so watch my Facebook page, John Pilot Mysteries, or go to the MGOPod.com. I'll try to put uh, updates there to let you know whenever we have a freebie being given away. But really, just check for yourself. And if you've got them all, it'd be so great if you uh, bought a copy for people for Christmas, uh, paperbacks or ebooks, or just let everybody know on social media that uh, one of your fave authors has got some free freebies out there for you. Okay? All right. Well, I am... Uh, stone in love with the idea of not having any pain and i hope you got through this one without cringing too very much but uh, thanks so much for being a listener and i hope you had a fantastic thanksgiving and i'll be back definitely hopefully with guests but if not with guests you'll have me back before the end of the year before christmas for sure until next time keep reading Get a credit card that gives you what you need now. A low interest rate on everyday purchases and a place to transfer high interest rate balances. The PenFed Gold Contactless Card is our lowest interest rate credit card. You can even earn a $100 statement credit when you spend $1,500 in the first 90 days. Join PenFed and together we can help you keep more of what's yours. Visit PenFed.org slash gold card. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. From regular expenses to occasional splurges, there's a lot to buy. Why not get cash back every time you spend? With the PenFed Power Cash Rewards Card, you get cash back on every purchase. That's everywhere, every time you use it. You can even earn a $100 statement credit when you spend $1,500 in the first 90 days. Visit PenFed.org slash PowerCash to apply. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. This episode is brought to you by Spotify and Anchor, your source for the best in music, podcasts, and more. You can also be someone who helps bring more to your life with Mysterious Goings On by being a listener supporter. Please click on the link in our show notes and you will be offered three tiers for support. We have a 99 cent per month tier, $4.99 per month, and $9.99 per month. You can buy it with Google Pay or use with a credit card instead. This helps keep the show going. I could use your support if you really enjoy Mysterious Goings On and lots of you have since 2016. We'd love to keep going and some listener support like you would be very, very helpful to me in keeping the show moving right along there. So as I always say at the end of every show, keep reading, but also keep listening and please consider supporting Mysterious Goings On. I am Connor Braden, host of the Story of a Storyteller podcast, author of The Longest Night and General Egypt, and you are listening to Serious Goings On.